Hey everyone, so welcome to chapter four, and chapter four is a chapter on liberalism. So we've looked at realism, we've sort of talked about it in the context of what realism is, and you've had a chance to explore and see some examples of realism in action. This chapter is chapter four, is the next step in that, and is the counter counterpoint to uh, realist thinking. And in this chapter particularly, one of the things you'll find, we'll look at and basically basically define what liberal liberalism is. We will um, set up the framework for, you know, uh, basically the notion of human nature and how we as human beings naturally operate or what we believe about the world around us. Just like under realism, uh, the idea is that, you know, pe the realist or people who have that sort of belief system basically operate under the mindset that the world is kind of negative, right? The people are basically power and self-motivated, and so therefore they need to institute strong measures to be able to secure themselves. And by extension of that, their nations need to be stronger than other nations in order to, because the world is a dangerous place, and the presumption is that the world is always going to be that way, and it takes a very sort of negative view of human beings, and very much in the vein of uh, Thomas Hobbes and Machiavelli and folks like that. Um, and so, consequently, the liberal side is more of the optimistic nature. Um, it takes a very sort of positive view of human beings and human nature and comes to a different and arrives at a different end for how to leave the world in a better place and, uh, and how, we, how we go about the process of doing that. And so with that, uh, the basic framework uh, under liberal thinking is cooperation. It's about overcome versus conflict. So instead of going to fight, let's figure out how to cooperate or find some consensual point that we can land on to, to avoid, you know, killing or going to war. Um, this ideology has been around for a long time. And unfortunately, in many ways, you know, it struggles because, you know, innately there are human beings and human nature that, have, that push it in another direction. And anytime you get involved with power and greed and money, um, those things get a little murky. So there are, there are times when liberal thinking is, is, uh, is important in terms of developing policies and ideas and strategies, uh, how we deal or interact with other countries. On the other hand, you could easily argue for the opposite of that, that there's a logic path why sometimes it's important to take a sort of realistic view of the world as well. Um, but under this aspect, understanding that notion of cooperation, liberal theorists basically kind of emphasize, you know, key features of world politics. And there's four different basic sort of, in this chapter, we'll look at four basic types of liberal uh, liberalist. Uh, one is sort of this, what we call the sociological liberals. And these are basically, the focus here, it really has to do with looking at transnational and, and non-governmental entities and basically the societies and the org how they interrelate, how do they interrelate with one another and communicate and, and work together uh, to form or decide uh, the outcomes of various policies and, and, and uh, issues. So uh, it could be between individuals or it could be between groups, you know, non-governmental groups. Um, it'd be, for example, it could be looking at Save the Whales, for example, you know, you know who, and Save the Whales is dealing with lots of different issues. And so how they react or deal with uh, other entities to try to achieve their goals of, of Save the Whales or any other entities like that, for example. Um, the second type is called interdependence liberals. And these basically, they pay, their focus primarily is on economic ties uh, and, and sort of this sort of mutual ex exchange of ideas and, and economic dependence. Uh, and it also not just between people, but also between governments. This is a link to what we used to, in my field, we call coercive diplomacy. And in the modern age, meaning in the last, say, 20 to, 20 to 30 years particularly, uh, coercive diplomacy has, has been utilized much more within the economic framework has been utilized much more than the physical use of force and taking that type of action. It's basically where I can control you by virtue of, by how well I let you thrive or survive with or without money. That's why the United States being so powerful economically can dictate to poorer countries their policies or, or, or our personal agenda because of the amount of money that we can control their governments with and, and uh, how they act or react. Uh, and what they even institute in their own countries as far as policies are driven by what we, the United States, want to see happen. Um, 
And then the next type are called institutional liberals. And institutional liberals basically sort of focus primarily on the importance of the uh, organized cooperation uh, between nation states. You know, so that that is the fundamental uh, first step in trying to, you know, achieve stability and peace uh, and understanding is through the through the organized cooperation uh, instead of conflict between nation states. Iran, as I mentioned once before, democracies tend not to go to war with one another, civilized democracies, and so this aspect sort of folds right into their that idea. Um, the next and fourth type is called uh, Republican liberals. And they basically uh, argued that liberal democratic constitutions and the forms of government are of vital importance uh, for ensuring peaceful, co cooperative relationships between nation states. So it's more focused on the constitutions uh, and types of governments in, ter in the quest for uh, peace and stability. And so these four types um, uh, or strands of liberal thinking uh, and also in, in, in conjunction with these more modern context of neo uh, realist thoughts uh, basically bring us to a, a question of you know how we move forward in the world in terms of negotiating or creating policies and interacting interrelating with other nations around the world uh, and so this is the first step uh, toward that process so in conjunction you know and moving forward we will you know one of the things we'll be discussing it along with, you know, the idea of cooperation and, you know, how to achieve peace and, you know, sort of how progress of the human race is basically the rationale uh, that optimists utilize for thinking that there's a hopeful space that we have to exist in, despite, you know, what many argue we're at a very negative time in our history uh, and the world history uh, and uh, with all the stresses and strains, whether it be by virtue of climate or economics or, you know, security issues, uh, that we're at a pretty negative space right now, and yet optimists still find a reason to be hopeful. Uh, so we'll talk about that in, in this chapter, uh, and we'll focus on historical context and look at some of the, you know, what progressive liberals, you know, what their assertions are in terms of looking at the historical or empirical evidence and looking at, you know, so what is it, what does the history tell us about the outcomes of uh, various events of crises and wars and uh, different other situations that we that exist in utilizing liberal thinking versus realist thinking um, and we'll look at again the various arguments for that you know based on those four types of liberalism uh, we'll also look at some events that have also uh, uh, that we find to be very important in this uh, context as well and like for example we'll look at 911 and Look at, you know, did that really, did that set back or deter liberal thinking or liberal ideas because of what took place in 9-11 uh, with the two planes flying into the World Trade Center along with the Pentagon and other places? Um, and so uh, we'll look at that and we'll be able to really have, you know, ask some tough questions. And, you know, one of the things you may find as you go through this process is that there really is no, you know, panacea or perfect, uh, you know, theory and that sometimes you have to utilize all of them to be able to arrive at a decision or arrive at a policy that's going to be viable when addressing you know, other countries and trying to figure out how in the midst of if there is a crisis or event that exists, how to be able to you know, overcome and arrive at some moment of peace and stability uh, or, or stand to stance or a, uh, what we call a state of detente, you know, where you basically everybody draws a line in the sand and stays on their side of the line. Uh, and uh, so we will we will look at that uh, throughout this chapter as well. You know, so one of the the, the questions that is posed in, in fact, you'll find it in the module uh, under one of the under one of the PDFs. You'll see under liberalism, ask a very interesting question. And these are just basically sort of you know human just basic human questions about how we see the world around us or how you see the world around you. And if I were to ask you the question, is is the world so safer today than at other points in times, and I know most of you are pretty young, but those of you who studied history a little bit may understand some of the previous, you know, times in history. Do you feel like we're in a safer place today than in previous points, or do you feel like we're in a more dangerous place, right? Uh, and if so, you know, do you think that in the in the long run this is going to continue, or do you think things are going to get better, right? And the liberal would argue that, well, yeah, things are bad, and but things can always get better. Um, 
if you look throughout and you'll see below there as you go through you'll see there's some charts and stuff that denote uh basically you'll see basically the annual number of deaths uh battles that we've had the annual number of deaths between like 19 post-world war ii up until the early 21st century um and you'll see diff various times where there's spikes but you could argue that since the end of world war ii while we have had lots of wars and violence and death that uh, in terms of real numbers, it's much less than previous uh, the previous years before that time. Now, um, you know, when when you talk about liberal ideas, one of the things that many liberals argue that it's really the foundation of modern democracy. Uh, and when we talk about liberal democracy, we're really talking about basically the notion of free and fair elections, having a rule of law that's that's protected and insulated. And that, your, and that your rights as a citizen are protected by your as by your civil liberties, you know, life, liberty, and property, which are the essence of the first ten amendments of the Constitution, also called the Bill of Rights. Um, and so, you know, liberal ideas have certainly evolved uh, since the development of liberalism, and uh, it certainly within the modern context as it require it const it's constantly as history moves forward and there's new evidence the the beauty of these theories even though they're traditional in their in their in their foundation it's just like our constitution it can be amended these theories can be amended as well as they have to take on new evidence they can reevaluate or amend their thinking to address the modern context of where we are today and you know the idea if you look at liberalism in its purest form going back to classical liberal uh, conservatism is, you know, 250 years ago, you know, it's a very different view of the world than modern liberalism. And so recognizing the, the, the stop points in history where the ideologies change is also very important. Um, and so, it, you know, one of the things that one of the premises it also suggests is about how institutions and institutions, behaviors and economic con uh, connections uh, can help mitigate violent powers uh, within states. Um, if you have those foundational institutional you know, situations in place, you may be able to stabilize and protect not only your own democratic institutions, but also help other nation states uh, get down that road as well. Uh, also, when we look at liberalism, one of the other positive aspects I would argue is that uh, compared to realism, um, there are, it just takes in more mitigating factors um, in, into it takes in more into consideration uh, regarding uh, the impact of and influence of citizens, collective citizens, and, and also international organizations and outcomes, and the importance of you know like the United Nations or the you know uh, the World Trade Organization or the you know World Health Organization or things like this, and and that's where I think their sense of optimism sort of on a global scale comes with comes from as opposed to realist thinking. Um, you know, so in, in, in sort of like tying this up, it really is about the notion of what are the, what are the liberals really want? Well, they want to certainly, you know, reduce wars and try or try to avoid wars at, at all costs, utilizing the rule of law and cooperation and political institutions and, you know, uh, the values and understandings of certain societies. Uh, and of course, looking at international institutions to spread democracy and democratic principles, uh, but also in the same vein to be able to do this in a way that will help, you know, help us all recognize that there is a greater good to be had by us working cooperatively together as opposed to uh, separating ourselves and uh, utilizing those entities within our own framework of our own countries, but also uh, as international bodies to be able to, to come together to uh, make decisions that are going to, to serve the, the, the world in general and not just our individual nation states. This is very difficult, by the way, for most nations. Most nations don't want to give up their own personal power to an international body, say, for example, the United Nations, in order to sustain themselves or in order to cooperate with the rest of the world. It's almost like they want to cooperate as long as it cooperates in their favor. <laughs> That's typically, there's, there's always a little selfish motivation for most nation states, which is completely sort of antithetical to, or, or opposite, if you would, of realist, of, excuse me, of uh, liberal thinking. So, it is a sort of a, a complicated mess when you look at it. However, 
there's great hope in the process as well because of the fact that, you know, it doesn't give up hope on human nature and human beings. And that right there is probably enough in the fact of recognizing that human beings can be reasoned with and can, if given an opportunity, will come to some sort of rational, moral, ethical base of understanding uh, about issues. And um, <clears throat> and that's what they hope for. And that's kind of where they land uh, in principle and also in application. Uh, they recognize that there is some self-interest. They recognize that there is competition in the system. Uh, and that people may, you know, again, have their own self-interest, but they, but they also believe that uh, within that interest that there are commonalities and that with cooperation and collaboration that they can achieve what they want. Um, and that gives us basically the premise of liberalism and gives you a good point of starting. And um, that's it. I will see you in Chapter 5. You guys have a great day. By the way, I've been trying to find different places to hang out where I can do this outside, so I hope it wasn't too loud and too much background noise. You guys take care.